The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com. Добрий вечір, шановні колеги, друзі. Для тих, хто приєднався до нас вперше, я хочу відразу попросити переключити на переклад, і кому потрібен переклад, звичайно, прошу натиснути кнопку interpretation для того, щоб чути все переклади, ми будемо говорити англійською мовою. Dear colleagues and friends uh, from Ukraine and from all over the world, um, on behalf of, I'm Vyacheslav Pogatilo, and on behalf of MIM Kyiv Business School, the first uh, business school in Ukraine, uh, welcome uh, on Reinforced US project that, that is designed in order to uh, enforce and inspire Ukrainian business community. Uh, under current circumstances, we decided it is important to widen the perspectives we are looking uh, in the future. And therefore, we invited the most known intellectual uh, to share their views on issues uh, which world at the moment is facing and um, uh, which became probably the most important also because of the invasion of Russia, war in Russia in Ukraine. Uh, the project was made possible due to the support of Bogdan Havrilishin Family Foundation and three business uh, associations, a a AACSB, AMBA, and EFMD. We are grateful for all donations you have made during registering on our platform. Uh, and uh, please be aware that all funds that uh, have been raised uh, will be directed to the support of you temporarily displaced Ukrainian women uh, who uh, are going to launch their own businesses. Before I shall give the floor to our guest today, I'd like to remind you that uh, we shall have question and answer session at the end, and you may ask questions by pushing the Q&A button. Uh, you may use any language, but please do not use chat for these purposes. And now I have a privilege to um, uh, welcome our honorable guest, um, who is the truly inspiring scholar, the author of several books, um, that encourage to review and somehow to rethink and change usual, usual business practices and policies. Uh, Mr. Navira Joe is the fellow of Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge and has spoken and written widely on the theme of frugal innovation. What is frugal innovation? Uh, probably we shall learn now, but we are eager to learn how uh, with uh, uh, less how to transform actually impediments of uh, uh, of of uh, of having no no as much resources as we need uh, to opportunities uh, for further development. Mr. Rajo, uh, welcome. It's a great pleasure that you agreed to share uh, your time with us, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Slava, for uh, the kind introduction, and uh, I want to thank uh, Mim Kiv for taking this initiative. Um, and for inviting me, um, and I'm honored to contribute to Reinforce uh, UA. And uh, so let me um, bring up my slides here. Uh, here we go. Okay, so uh, essentially I want to discuss with you about, as uh, Slava nicely introduced, uh, the need to do better with less, which is essentially as you think about rebuilding Ukraine, in the medium or maybe even long term, it's important to realize that you know uh, resources will get scarce, uh, whether we want it or not. Um, so the question is, how do we do better with less? And that's really the art and science of uh, frugal innovation, a topic that um, I've studied for the past 15 years that I want to discuss with you today. Um, so I want to begin by uh, discussing, so this presentation today, I divided it in two parts. The first part, is to discuss about a new mindset that uh, is important to develop uh, in order to turn adversity into opportunity and look in every crisis um, uh, an opportunity for value creation. So that's why I want to start with that first uh, about the new mindset. And then we'll talk about uh, different principles that you can apply whether you're an entrepreneur or uh, a business leader to systematically um, apply this concept of uh, frugal innovation 
to do better with less. So let's begin with the first part, which is, you know, why do we need to create a new mindset? And the new mindset is what? It's about actually looking at the glass as always being half full. That is that in every crisis, there is a solution. And often we worry about the crisis and the complexity of the crisis, but inside at the core of the crisis, there is a solution. And this is what MacGyver, right? Uh, my favorite uh, TV action hero is known for because he can pull himself out of any difficult situation uh, using very limited resources he has, you know, it could be his uh, Swiss army knife or duct tape. And more importantly, he has this ability to look at every problem as a solution. And um, this is what I wrote about uh, exactly 10 years ago. Uh, we published this book called uh, Jugad Innovation. And Jugad is a Hindi word, which means the creative ability to solve problems with limited resources. And I think in uh, Ukrainian, you call it the uh, Vinna Kidlevist, which means uh, resourcefulness or ingenuity. And um, this Jugad mindset uh, has three important components. It's about being frugal, it's about being agile, and it's being inclusive. So I want to talk about first, what does it mean to be frugal? It's about not complaining that you don't have a particular resource and say, oh, I don't have you know, uh, money, I don't have human resources, I don't have technologies, but identify, celebrate, and optimize the resources you already have, sometimes abundant, but are um, undervalued. And um, so the first example to illustrate this is uh, Mansuk Prachapati, who is a porter by training in India. He developed a fridge made entirely of clay. So essentially he used what is, uh, he knows, which is uh, the pottery as a, as a technique. And then he applied his knowledge to create something that is valuable for villages in India, where, as you know, they don't have electricity. And this fridge can keep fruits and vegetables fresh for many days without requiring electricity. So this is an example where you reframe resource scarcity as actually a big opportunity to innovate and create value. So this is a more a, a low-tech example, right? Let me give you a high-tech example of that. Uh, today, the data centers, um, you know, when you use Google or you use Facebook or even Zoom right now, we are using these data centers, right, to process data and share data. And the data centers today use 3% of the global electricity. They use 1.5% to power the servers. And then as the servers heat up, they use another 1.5% to cool down the servers. You can see the aberration, right, in this uh, centralized computing paradigm. So that's why, uh, and the reason this is happening is because engineers think that, oh my God, you know, when the servers get too hot, we need to get rid of the heat, right? Otherwise they will damage the servers. But what if you look at the heat generated by the computing servers as an opportunity? This is what um, Paul Benoit, uh, a French engineer, uh, uh, thought about. And he launched this startup co company called uh, Carnot Computing, which designs digital radiators. So essentially inside the radiators, you have microprocessors that can, so whenever you do like a Google search, um, the request goes to the distributed network of these processors. And then the heat generated by the processors is harvested to heat homes and offices. And the same way he has also created um, digital boilers uh, that can be used to boil water while at the same time, you know, processing data. And today, uh, big banks like uh, BNP Paribas, uh, Société Générale, uh, as well as uh, big retailers like Casino are using this decentralized uh, data processing model uh, from Carnot Computing, which could reduce um, the carbon footprint of data centers by 75%. So this is a high-tech example of you know, uh, doing more with less. Now let's talk about being agile. And being agile is something we saw a lot during COVID crisis. Uh, for instance, in uh, Italy, uh, a doctor named uh, Renato Favero uh, teamed up with a designer to adapt 
uh, the Decathlon uh, scuba diving mask into respirators uh, to save the lives of uh, COVID patients who require, as you know, a ventilator. Because he asked himself the question, why not? Right? That's agile mindset. Why not take a scuba diving mask and turn it into a medical device? We don't think about it, right? But he, he came up with this idea. So that's being about agile. And the same way, uh, Louis Schweizer, the former CEO of the car company Renault, asked himself the question, why not build a car for 5,000 euros? Back in 1999, this sounded like a crazy idea. But in 2004, they famously launched a 5,000 euro car called the Logan. They didn't stop there. Then they went to India. And in 2015, they built locally, the design built locally a car using three times less R&D spending than in France. And they launched this car called Quid in 2015 for just 3,500 euros. And then they took the same car platform, this car platform, and they built an electric car in China called the Quid Electric, which was launched in 2019 for 8,000 euros. And then last year, they upgraded this with some more safety features and introduced that in uh, France as Europe's cheapest uh, electric car called Dacia Spring for about 12,000 euros. And what's interesting is that uh, all these car platforms share the same underlying platform. So they reuse the same platform to build different models for different countries and including some of the electric cars. The third attribute of this Jugad mindset, it's about being inclusive. Um, and you know, I lived in Silicon Valley, right? So um, this iPhone is uh, cost 1000 euros and only 10% of the world population, right? Can use this. Uh, what about 90% of the world population, right? They also need to have access, right? To phone and, uh, and, and communication. So this is why we need to think about creating innovation that is inclusive. That means it's accessible to as many people as possible, even if they are poor. And um, let me give you an example. Uh, today, uh, when the premature babies are born in the Western world, we keep them in incubators. And these incubators cost $20,000 and require electricity, which is very expensive and Electricity is not reliable in uh, developing countries in Africa and Asia. So five students from Stanford designed this uh, incubator, which looks more like a small sleeping bag. It's an infant warmer. And uh, inside you have a material that is like wax that you can put on a heating pad, it melts. And you put it back inside the infant warmer and you can keep the baby at constant temperature for six hours straight very simple low-tech solution that cost only $200, 1% of the cost of incubators sold in the West. And this simple solution has saved already the lives of 300,000 babies worldwide. So you can see how by thinking inclusively, you can create a solution that brings more hope and dignity to uh, millions of people worldwide. So the first message so far, right, is that if you want to rebuild Ukraine, it's important to cultivate this uh, kind of uh, Jugad mindset that will enable you to become, first of all, think frugally, more agile way, and more inclusively. But once you start thinking that way, right, then you have to act differently as well. And this is what we want to talk about now, which is you know, the fact that to build a better Ukraine, we also need to innovate differently. I spent 13 years living in Silicon Valley, and I've seen the kind of innovation that I don't think you want to do in Ukraine. Uh, for instance, uh, $140 million or something were raised uh, as a uh, venture capital to invest in this company, this startup called Juicero, which uh, sold a juicer, a machine to make juices for $400, 400 euros, sorry. And it turned out to be no more effective than the manual you know, juicer that I use every morning that costs maybe you know, $2, right? Um, so the message here is that uh, creating expensive innovation using a lot of money can sometimes be useless, right? Uh, instead, when you compare with the embrace 
uh, baby warmer I talked about, right, for $200, this is a frugal innovation. It's very cost-effective, low-cost solution, but more imp importantly, it is very useful. It generates greater impact at lower cost. And this is really what we mean by frugal innovation, which is the art of doing better with less. And I'm delighted that uh, this book is available in Ukrainian language as well um, that you can read. And um, in this book, actually, uh, we first define uh, what is frugal innovation. And frugal innovation, as I said, it's about doing better with less. That means creating more value and values using fewer resources or trying to make the most of the resources you have. When we say value, it's about economic value and social value and ecological value. So it's not just about you know, creating more financial value, but also social impact and impact on the planet. And then when it comes to resources, we are talking about capital as well as energy and time as well. So this is the definition of frugal innovation. And in the book, we actually uh, introduce six principles for adopting frugal innovation if you are a startup or a small medium business or a large company. And today I want to focus on three principles, beginning with the first principle, which is flexing all your resources. Flexing means, you know, like a muscle, right? So it's about how do you flex your muscle, uh, you know, like resources, how do you flex them like a muscle? That means how do you optimize all the resources you have? It's not as much about minimizing the resources, but stretching, flexing all the resources you have. And again, right, this is what it's about, right? It's about not complaining that, oh my God, I need more resources, but look at the resources you already have and make the most out of that. And for instance, during COVID again, we saw this, uh, how it can be uh, you know, uh, done. Um, we had a major shortage of ventilators um, and uh, some companies said, you know, why don't we reuse existing technologies to create ventilators? So the company Dyson, uh, which you know is a British company that makes uh, you know, vacuum cleaners, uh, they took the digital mortar inside and they adapted it to make a ventilator, as you can see here, and they made 10,000 uh, units of such a ventilator. And you know, by simply reusing the same um, uh, mortar, digital mortar. And so this is the first example, right? The second example is actually comes from Ukraine itself, where there's a shortage you know, with the war going on uh, of body armor. And I saw this article in NPR where volunteers are actually uh, making body armor by reusing uh, scrap from old cars. And uh, that photo, uh, the bottom is, uh, I think a fashion designer uh, who actually is applying her skills uh, to uh, sew these uh, body armor as well. So this is another way, right? Of saying, okay, what do we have right now? You know, we don't have more body armors, but we have a lot of old cars. How do we scrap the materials? But also what are the skills we have, right? I'm a fashion designer. How do I apply the skill to have a positive impact on society because that's what, they, what, that's what the society wants for me right now. Likewise, you know that uh, water, you, you heard about that is getting scarce. Um, and uh, in Israel, uh, which as you know, mostly is a desert, um, there are uh, startups that are using humidity in the air to create water out of that. Uh, for instance, uh, WaterGen is one company that can create a uh, different size of uh, machines that uh, absorb the humidity in the air, purifies it, and can generate drinkable water out of thin air, okay? So this is the kind of solution we are going to need in the future, uh, not only in uh, poor countries, right? But also in places like um, uh, Los Angeles, California, and places like that, where there's gonna be a lot of water shortage. So likewise, uh, you can also, uh, transform ambient light into electricity uh, because, for instance, there are 50 billion uh, objects that are connected to the internet, right? Uh, it's called Internet of Objects, and they all require battery to operate, which is not sustainable, right? So that's why this uh, startup called uh, Dracula Technologies is using light as a source of energy. 
specifically what they do is they uh, they can 3D print or print in using normal printer, uh, tiny photovoltaic cells that you can integrate into everyday objects like your bag, for instance, and that becomes a charger. So instead of carrying you know, a charger for your mobile phone, your bag itself will charge the mobile phone on the go. And this can be used even in dark places. Uh, so it doesn't need solar light. It can be even using you know, the photons in dark places. That's why it's called Dracula Technologies. It works even in the shadows in dark places. Uh, Africa is another place where um, they are uh, leapfrogging from no banking to mobile banking because instead of building more physical branches of banks, uh, uh, Africa has an abundance of mobile connectivity. As you know, 90% uh, uh, of Africans today uh, have a mobile phone. So the M-Pesa service in Kenya enables uh, more than half the population in Kenya to send receive money using their mobile phone without having a bank account. And these people will never have a bank account in their life, right? Because they go straight to mobile banking. And once you have mobile money available, you can use it not just to shop on Amazon, but to uh, buy useful things, things like solar electricity. The same company, uh, M-Pesa, launched another company called M-Copa, which uh, offers uh, uh, modular uh, uh, solar uh, energy systems that you can install on yourself in your house or in your shop. And uh, when President uh, Obama went to Africa, he visited them because they have a very innovative uh, pricing model, right? Which is pay as you go. So you simply use your mobile phone to pay for solar energy on a daily basis, weekly basis, or monthly basis. And when you don't, when you don't need electricity, you don't have to pay. So you don't have to depend uh, you know, on a monthly subscription like we do in France or in America. So this is a flexible thinking, right? Again, right? It's frugal, it's flexible, and inclusive as well. With the solution, even poor people in villages now can go straight from candlelight to solar light. This is called leapfrogging uh, in uh, development economics. So the message here is this. As you rebuild Ukraine, you will face a shortage of tangible resources like capital, skilled employees, new technologies. So rather than worrying or complaining about that, it's important to identify and leverage abundant intangible resources you may have as a society, uh, human ingenuity, empathy, resilience, technical expertise, uh, or it could also be your social capital, the trust you have among each other as a community, right? That is missing some time, for example, in the US. So these are the resources to leverage to create more value um, and, and rebuild Ukraine in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more effective way. The, the second principle um, I want to focus on is how Ukraine can, again, leapfrog, uh, not to sustainable development, but go beyond that. And what is beyond that is called regeneration. It's a new concept that is becoming more and more popular. Um, and what is regeneration is that uh, when we look at the climate change, which we know today, right, is a clear and present danger, it's important to not just thinking about doing less harm to the planet. Because today, we have many companies who claim to be sustainable businesses. And what they are saying is that, oh, we are going to reduce our carbon footprint by 2030. You know, we are going to reduce by 50% our carbon emissions by 2040, or we are going to recycle our waste. It's called the circular economy, right? Where you recycle your waste to make new products. This is great. This is still very good. This is what sustainable development is about. For instance, the jeans maker, Levi Strauss, makes jeans out of uh, recycled plastic waste collected from wash oceans, right? You know, that made a lot of plastic waste uh, floating on oceans. They collect that and they make genes out of that. That's nice. But what we are finding now is that uh, according to uh, studies done with younger consumers, uh, they want brands, companies to go beyond sustainability and become regenerative 
businesses because sustainability means it's like very passive. It's about sustaining things as they are. Regeneration is about renewing the existing economic system to make it more inclusive and uh, more beneficial for humans. So that's really what regeneration is about. It's about going from, oh, I do less harm to the planet and the society to how can I intentionally do more good to people, places, and planet. And that's what I mean by boosting the health and the vitality of people, communities, and the planet. This is what a regenerative business does. So let me um, quickly give some examples and, and, and conclude. Um, this is Interface, a company that makes uh, carpets uh, for offices, uh, hospitals, and the schools. And uh, they have uh, you know, already become a sustainable company. All the products are already carbon neutral. And now they're going one step further with what they call climate take back, where they want to love carbon. So what it means is that uh, they are building now products that are carbon negative. So these are products that absorb more carbon during the production cycle than they emit, okay? So that's why they call them carbon negative. Very few companies are today creating such products, but this company is also creating a new kind of factory, which is called factory as a forest. So what it does is that uh, this factory not only pollutes less, but it offers positive services to the local community. Uh, these services could be uh, drinkable water generated as a byproduct of the production cycle. Uh, it could be clean energy that could be generated on the roof of the factory and the excess energy is given freely to the local community, et cetera, et cetera. So there are about 22 value-added services that they are being offered freely by the factory as a, as a byproduct of, of the production process generously to the local community. So this is the regenerative factory, right? And uh, so think about, right, this notion of uh, what I call triple regeneration, right? So how can you build a business that is focused on regenerating human beings physically and mentally, and how to revitalize places like communities and also the planet by, for instance, absorbing carbon, and uh, producing positive ecosystem services as I explained earlier. And finally, the third uh, principle that I want to uh, close upon, uh, close with, is this notion of hyper collaboration. It sounds very uh, jargon, but what it means is that, uh, look at you know, business schools, right? You know, in business schools, I studied in business school 22 years ago, you know, the most prestigious uh, course in business schools, even today, it's called competitive strategy, right? And for many, many decades, right, that is the most popular course. Actually, it's the core course in any MBA pr uh, program. And the reason is because we think the marketplace is competition, right? So you have to compete with other companies to get a piece of the pie, so to speak, right? Essentially, a market share. Or you have to compete for scarce resources like oil, it could be um, you know uh, rare materials, right, being used um, you know for making uh, electronics, for instance. So the whole business world is um, infused with this competitive spirit. But what if you start thinking about cooperating and start sharing resources? And this is something that I have uh, studied for the past twenty-five years: how companies can collaborate and co-create value together by sharing resources rather than competing for limited resources. For instance, let me give you a couple of examples of how you can share resources, different kinds of resources. In Denmark, uh, in the Kallenberg um, Eco Industrial Park, 10 companies co-located share their waste, energy, and water as an integrated ecosystem. This is called industrial symbiosis, okay? Uh, it's also known as industrial ecology. Now, this is a great uh, example, right, of cooperation, which 
positively impacts the planet by reducing waste and emissions. But you can go one step further and we see, for instance, in France, where uh, we are practicing industrial ecology with the social consciousness. For instance, in um, Northeast of France, there is uh, a region, uh, this is a region where uh, several hundred companies are collaborating together to recycle their waste. But what's interesting is that they are using uh, people who are uh, underprivileged. It could be handicapped people or people who have financial difficulties as employees in the factories that recycle the waste. So in doing so, they are regenerating right, um, the society by giving uh, jobs to people who don't have jobs, as well as uh, helping the planet as well. So this is about sharing uh, you know, uh, waste and uh, raw materials, right? But then you can also go one step further and say, what if you start sharing medical equipment or construction equipment? This is happening in Netherlands uh, with a platform called uh, Flu2, which has built B2B, business to business, sharing marketplaces. And uh, they enable essentially companies like hospitals or uh, construction uh, uh, companies to share their medical devices and their services among each other. Uh, in doing so, they optimize the use of the valuable equipment uh, while also creating uh, you know, a positive impact on the environment. You can also think about sharing employees. Um, this is something emerging now with platforms. Uh, there are several of them in Europe, uh, in France. It's really taking off. Uh, for example, this platform is an interesting one. It's called Venetis. It's a 360 small medium companies that come together as an association and they recruit an expert, like for example, in uh, artificial intelligence or uh, industrial quality control in full-time, that's important, in full-time job, and then they share them among each other, right? So this allows 300 companies to have access to high quality talent in a shared way. Um, so this is the idea of you know, uh, shared time as opposed to uh, part-time jobs. Okay, um, and likewise, you can also think about sharing your clients. Now, this sounds radical, but think about what uh, McKinsey is saying is that uh, by 2025, one third of global revenues of companies will be generated by cross industry ecosystems. Like for example, right, think about mobility. Uh, now customers want end-to-end uh, -end mobility services or end-to-end -end healthcare services. That means different industries, different sectors have to come together to co-create an end-to-end -end solution, right? In mobility or healthcare, for example. That means different brands from different industries are coming together, like in the case of uh, in-home, which is a, 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 like a, a cross-industry innovation cluster where the brands that you see on the right-hand side come together to First, think about the needs of the customers in five, 10 years, and then they think about how can we integrate our capabilities and expertise to co-create an end-to-end -end solution to address comprehensively the needs of tomorrow's customers, their shared customers. And finally, uh, Danone, the yogurt company, uh, did something extraordinary where they made their collection of uh, 1,800 strains of uh, bacteria uh, used to make yogurt, for example, and they opened it up. They made it freely accessible to researchers worldwide so they can co-develop faster uh, solutions, frugal solutions to fight malnutrition and hunger worldwide. So this is also known as open innovation, right? And But this is the first time I know a company that is opening up his entire collection of intellectual property, right? Related to uh, strains in order to accelerate the development of solutions uh, to fight uh, hunger and malnutrition. malnutrition. And you can uh, consult uh, my report uh, titled The B2B Sharing Revolution published by Terra Nova. It's freely available on the website. Uh, where we give a lot of examples of uh, and best practices on how you can adopt 
uh, the notion of uh, B2B sharing in your industry or across industries as well. So in summary, I would say that uh, in, in my humble opinion that uh, to rebuild a better Ukraine, or I would say uh, this idea of uh, nation building, right? It's gonna be about nation building in the future. Um, you need two things. You need a new mindset, which I call the Jugad mindset, which will allow you to think frugally in an agile way and a more inclusive way. And then you need to have an approach, a system, a method that I call frugal innovation to systematically do better with less. Um, and you can apply these six principles I talked about um, to uh, uh, create more economic and social value and ecological value while optimizing all the resources you have, whether it's a tangible resources or immaterial resources. And these are some books and articles that you can read in order to uh, you know, go deeper into this topic. So with that, I want to, uh, I want to stop my uh, presentation here and we can switch to a discussion with uh, Slava. Thank you very much, Navi. Uh, it was very impressive. Uh, a lot of examples. Uh, uh, and, and I will start with a very simple question. That one of our participants asked, uh, uh, do you have your book in electronic form uh, available? Uh, only a printed copy. I, I, I don't know about the Ukrainian edition, uh, but definitely uh, if you go on Amazon, uh, you can get it from UK. Mm -hmm. It is, yes, uh, it's published by The Economist. And it is available as an ebook um, in in Europe. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, let's start with some practical. You you, you finished uh, with uh, with an idea how uh, um, Ukraine uh, can use this approach and this framework in order to uh, in order to um, recover uh, from from the current war. Uh, this is very important, and um, uh, we may use it practically. Um, you, you, you were a consultant, but probably you're still consulting uh, um, business companies and businesses, uh, business stakeholders, shareholders uh, should be very happy uh, if somebody comes and say, you know, you can get more uh, by spending less, by, by, by actually with less cost economically, uh, literally speaking, it's uh, more value by less cost. Uh, maybe it used cost at the moment and therefore more profit uh, because value creates uh, uh, high price uh, uh, typically and therefore it should be you know welcome very well what particularly companies should do uh, to let's say engage or to uh, start using this uh, uh, frugal innovation management let, let's call it uh, uh, what what to do because you know just, uh, um, I'm kidding, just to, to, to yeah. reduce the salary for R&D department, uh, or, or, or there are certain, let's say, general approach, or just a philosophy. Uh, thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the one way to get started is, uh, I tell companies that instead of thinking about this as a new concept, Right, because sometimes they think like, oh, you know, Navi comes and talks about something called frugal innovation, which sounds like lean management as well, right? So I explained to them that first of all, it's not about lean management, it's not about cutting costs. Uh, and you remember in the formula, right? It's about doing better with less. And the focus and, and the expression, right, is frugal innovation. If you take fr innovation away, it's not an interesting concept, right? It's just frugal. And frugal is a bad concept, right? Because it means austerity, right? You know that in Europe, that term people don't like. Austerity or um, sobriety or frugality essentially means, you know, tight your, tighten your belt, right? As consumers or as companies, it means cut salaries, you know, cut workforce. But the, here we are talking about frugal innovation. That means that the emphasis is on innovation. And innovation is about, oh, how can I create more value for communities? How can I create more value for um, the environment? And while doing that, can I also have a positive impact, right? In terms of cost reduction or generating new revenues. And this is why I would say that as you rightly ask, you don't want to cut the budget of R&D, but you need to broaden the scope of R and D. So the great example of that is uh, uh, Unilever, the consumer goods company, and they didn't cut the budget, but they changed the KPIs of the R and D department to make sure that you know all the products you know become carbon neutral, right? Um, uh, 
which they achieved already. And that basically means it creates more constraints, but it's not resource constraints. It's constraints here, right? So now the research, researchers have to develop new products that are at the same time delivering good performance while having negative impact, right, on the environment. So one good example of that is uh, they redesign their uh, deodorant uh, cans, so they use 50% less aluminum, right? In the process, it also reduces emissions by 50%. <laughs> and it's good for them be, uh, f uh, financially because it requires less packaging, right? So it's in a way, right? This is the way to think about uh, fluid innovation is uh, you don't cut the spending, but you try to, you know, create greater impact with the same spending, right? That's the way to think about, it, right? It's not about less spending, but the same spending in R&D or marketing but you think about, okay, how can I now have impact not only economically, but also socially and ecologically, right? So this is why it's, it's not only about a philosophy, it's actually a, a set of management practices, but the most important function in the organization that has to support this is the human resources department because they have to change the incentive, right? Systems and the KPIs to motivate the different functions uh, to think, as I said, frugally, agile way, and inclusively. KPI is a risky way, but, but okay, I, I, I will not discuss this right now. I, I do, I did like very much uh, your, uh, your example with Danone. And, and would you support, uh, I would do it directly, would you support being you know, responsible for the state to eliminate IP, uh, uh, let's say, uh, protection at all? which would immediately bring all the companies to the idea they do need to, let's say, to do more uh, with, with, let's say, the same or even the less. Danone um, I, created this, let's say, not austerity, but, but pressure in order to further uh, be the leader in the, in the industry. Uh, they no longer rely on their own, let's say, old, uh, old uh, achievement. Yes, so uh, th th that, that is, there are two ways you can do that, right? I mean, one, first you have to understand that uh, the, the innovation paradigm in the Western world, America and Europe, uh, we confuse innovation with invention, right? Uh, actually tomorrow I'm doing a, a panel uh, in France where we are thinking about how do we uh, encourage universities to become more innovative? And what we are going to discuss is that, you know, uh, people have to understand there's a difference between patenting. Patent means say you're just saying, oh, my idea is great, right? And I'm gonna put a patent on it. But doesn't mean that your invention is an innovation, right? That means that you are able to take an idea and make it commercially viable, right? That requires, you know, maybe a good business model. It requires the right partnerships, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And, and in, in the Western world, we put too much emphasis on, as you said, protecting IP, right? You know, investing more in R&D. And it's only in the last 10 years, there's a beginning of shift in the mindset among policymakers and people who fund innovation like European Commission to begin to think about, oh, wait a second, maybe we should encourage companies, right? To share their intellectual property. And that means essentially that maybe you don't protect very quickly your intellectual property, you look at, you know, how can I, like Danone is doing, right? Maybe they invent some stuff and then they can uh, share them with other companies. And then when they co-create new applications, that particular application can be protected, right? So you don't try to protect everything, right? In a preemptive way, but rather you create, like, think about this, right? Um, Slava, think about Lego bricks, right? You don't, you don't want to, IP protect every Lego brick, right? So they become freely accessible, right? And then when you put it them together, that particular solution can be protected, right? Mm -hmm. That's a different way of thinking about innovation in the future, right? Uh, like uh, coming, bringing together, assembling uh, building blocks of technology, for instance. And that's what's happening with new platform concepts, et cetera, right? So the whole, uh, idea of uh, protecting IP is an old paradigm uh, that is from an industrial era where, uh, remember the slide I used where the notion was, you know, uh, knowledge, 
in the 20th century, we thought that knowledge is power. So by protecting knowledge, we get more power. In the 21st century, sharing knowledge, right, is power, right? So that's why I talked about the notion of, you know, B2B sharing. And, and this is, as you can imagine, right? It, it's a radical shift in, par in paradigm. But in Ukraine, that's the beauty, right? You don't have to unlearn an old paradigm in order to learn something new. That's what I said. You can leapfrog. You can go straight to this notion of B2B sharing of intellectual property and resources like that. That means that you can create a, a more uh, liberal intellectual property uh, regime that encourages this kind of open innovation. Well, it, it, it's uh, too revolutionary. Uh, although probably nobody remembers that uh, knowledge is power coming from Francis Bacon from 17th century, but right. this is still more uh, as a popular uh, statement that you have just made. Uh, and even in the management, in the management school, people, uh, let's say, prefer to keep some knowledge, some secrets, and manage in this way rather than to share everything they knew. Uh, and that, that, that's, I agree with you. And, you know, IP issue is, is quite... Uh, I was discussing at the moment, uh, and I would say really that uh, in Ukraine, we are under force, by the way, from Americans uh, and, 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 and other countries, uh, let's say developed Western countries, uh, which have a very strict uh, uh, ideas that monopoly, uh, IP monopoly, intellectual property monopoly should be preserved. But I agree with you fully that it came back uh, uh, to, uh, let's say, 18th century and currently should be um, at least reviewed and revisited all, the, all these discussions. Um, okay, um, we have um, another, just for clarification, because one of our, one of our uh, participants uh, paid attention for your terms, re regenerate, yes, uh, to, to make more. But there is a technical term, regeneration, which is a part of sustainability approach. Uh, let's say, correct me if I'm wrong, or, or, or please Continue, repeat again, what do you mean by regeneration? Uh, by, by using, uh, I understood, less resources, creating more uh, value, less resources, first of all, uh, earth resources. Uh, yes. uh, by, like, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, let me give you a couple of examples, different industries, right? For instance, uh, let's take cosmetics, beauty products, right? Mm -hmm. You might say, oh, we are becoming sustainable. We don't test on animals. Uh, our products use fewer chemicals. <laughs> Think about cosmetics and food, right? That's important because it goes into the body, right? So that's about regenerating the people. Imagine today what you're saying is that, oh, we are a company that makes cosmetic products and uh, food products, and we are going to use less chemicals, and we are going to recycle our waste, right? That's fantastic. But there's a company in Brazil called Natura. I wanted to include them as an example, actually. Uh, they discovered that in Brazil, in the Amazon jungle, there is a particular palm tree called Murumuru that actually has um, uh, like a, uh, seeds that you can crush and it creates a butter that is 10 times more hydrating than any product in the market. <laughs> so what they did is that they teamed up with the tribal people, you know, the indigenous people in Amazon region to uh, cultivate the trees because in the past, these people were cut, were cutting the trees to use the wood to make things like brooms, right? Now they realize that by keeping the tree alive, they can generate seven times more value, economic value. That means that the money stays in the community. It regenerates the ancestral knowledge, right? The old traditional way, right? Of, of, of growing these trees and harvesting the seeds, crushing them, they do that manually, right, in the Amazon jungle. So that tradition is preserved. And then it's good for the customer because, you know, the, um, this, this um, hydrating uh, lotion doesn't leave uh, any uh, stains, right? And it hydrates deeply your uh, skin and your uh, hair scalp. I don't have any more. But uh, so, so that's, that's an example of regeneration, essentially, right? It's a, it's a product that actually regenerates uh, mm -hmm human body, it regenerates local communities, and it's also good for the planet because if you're keeping the trees alive, you're not reducing the biodiversity, right, in Amazon jungle. 
Okay, I, and I understood it. Uh, and th thank you for clarification because this uh, regeneration is is a technical term uh, widely used and therefore could could be mixed somehow. Sure. Uh, uh, ne next, uh, you travel a lot, and you actually. Uh, somehow born in, in India, uh, studied in France, uh, lived in the US, uh, various jobs in different continents. And, uh, do, do you see personally uh, differences in managing in, in this particular approach, for example, this exception uh, of, this, of this approach in different companies, um, in different nationalities? Um, so, uh, and, and if you see this difference, uh, why, what in your opinion uh, is the roots uh, uh, kind of national rules could let's say some nations some countries be more receptive to to this kind of ideas and others uh, uh, may not uh, it's a great uh, it's a good question slava because that's something that i have been uh, because uh, being american european and uh, and french at least and and the indian what i see is that uh, think about this way right in america frugal means reducing cost right mm -hmm. so companies will say yeah we want to do frugal innovation so that we can reduce our cost or we can make Apple, right? I don't know if you know, but Apple is embracing frugal innovation so they can make the phones uh, like 60, 70, it's okay, 30% cheaper uh, to sell in India, right? So th that's what American companies think, right? So about how can I make products cheaper and use uh, less, uh, less, fewer cost, right? That's the American definition of frugal innovation. In India, it's also about making things cheaper because many people don't have basic things like in Africa, right? India, frugal means like inclusion, right? How can I make uh, banking services, uh, uh, solar energy, right? Very affordable for people who never had access to electricity, right? Or, or uh, banking services, et cetera. So it's more about social inclusion, right? Is the focus. In Europe, particularly in France, Frugal innovation right now, as we speak, is mostly focused on environment, right? So it means like, how can I create products that, uh, you know, reduce emissions? Like the, the example I gave, right? Uh, products that are carbon negative, right? So it's about being frugal in terms of impact on the environment, okay? But at the same time, as you know, uh, the poverty is increasing in Europe. 22% of uh, European population is at risk of poverty. Uh, in France, the number is about 19%. So what, what we see happening is that essentially in Europe, there is the focus on frugal innovation, which is both on the ecological dimension and more and more on the social dimension, because it's about making products right more affordable for more people, including middle class. So this is what I see in three cultures. America is all about using frugal, that means making products like Amazon, right? Amazon is a frugal company because they make everything cheaper for customers, but it's not good necessarily for the environment, right? Or even on the social side, how they treat the employees um, and things like that. But that's because America is about doing what, give what customers want, right? Um, in India, it's also about in a way, giving what customers want except these are first time customers, right? People who never had access, right? To any basic services and products now can afford these products for the first time because of frugal business models, right? And then in, in Europe, we are a bit in stuck between, right? And we are thinking, okay, frugal, that's why I gave the definition of uh, frugal innovation because in Europe and more and more in France is the only place in the world where companies are thinking for innovation along the three dimensions, right? Economic, social, and ecological. Uh, in most other places of the world, it tends to be focused on either social or ecological, or like in America, economic dimension only, only one dimension. Um. You know, we, we are we, you are not in Ukraine. I'm in Ukraine, and uh, uh, the project is Ukrainian, uh, and we have currently quite uh, 
France had a very tough time, uh, the war and the tragedies. Uh, uh, from the other side, uh, uh, this uh, situation, when you see the destructions, whatever, uh, uh, there is certain kind of a specific optimism about the future. Uh, about uh, how we can, um, uh, how can we not just rebuild, but to create uh, a new, a new, uh, a new country, a new society, uh, new ideas. Uh, so people uh, in Ukraine uh, currently are very receptive uh, to to new ideas. They want, they want uh, the, this new to come. What uh, we have a question from from the audience. Uh, uh, what's in your opinion? So it's a bit like you know managing country or governing country. Um, what uh, is your ideas about what kind of, uh, um, let's say, either difficulties uh, um, Ukraine on this way need to overcome? Or uh, what kind of uh, issues uh, uh, um, should be first of all taken into account in order to bump into this uh, new trends, uh, worldwide trends uh, that uh, currently um, is develop are developing? And you mentioned some, for example, you mentioned Internet of Things, you know all these connectivities. Uh, you mentioned these uh, sustainability issues that that is going on. Uh, what would be let's say, directly your advices? to Ukrainians uh, uh, in order to use this uh, framework and uh, let's say, uh, I don't want this uh, build back better, <laughs> to build better. <laughs> no, I, I actually, I'm, I'm, back, so I'm, 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 I'm so happy you used that term because I wanted to actually talk about that. So that let, let's talk about build back better, right? If you remember, this is exactly the concept that took off in 2020 when COVID began. I was very excited. I did a lot of webinars, uh, by the way, in US and, and Europe around this concept of how do we build back better? Because my hope was that in 2020, 2021, wow, you know, the Western world went through COVID. It shook up consciousness and people are suddenly going to become more enlightened and we are going to focus on social and environmental issues, et cetera. But what happened is that once the crisis was over, pretty much, right, uh, this year, what I see is that there's no build back better. It's like build, build back to where we were before, right? right? And that's also why the term sustainability, right, is not the best. It means about maintaining the status quo. It's about going back to the way we were before. And that's because that's how, you know, um, uh, probably, um, you know, Yuval Arari may talk better than me, right? It's the human brain, the evolutionary, right? That's how we are wired, right? It's called the rebound effect. Right, we 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 were so like uh, uh, deprived of a lot of things during you know crises like you know COVID and the war that we go back to what we are familiar with, right? And the unknown uh, during uh, a war or COVID is attractive because the present scenario is so frightening that you're willing to let go of the present, right? And 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 adopt something different. But once the crisis is over. <laughs> Our limbic system goes back to what is familiar, right? We don't like newness, something original and different. So th that's why I think two things are important. And, and, and I really uh, would like to share this with you because I was thinking that maybe in this crisis, as it's happening, you need to start documenting the kind of frugal innovations, right? That is happening right now in Ukraine. We talked about, you know, things like building body armor, et cetera, and to make people understand that, you know, this is not a, a temporary fix, you know, Th this is a, a new paradigm that is becoming the norm, right, globally. And therefore, we need to think about preserving these best practices that emerged during this war and, 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 and scale them up, right, once the war is over and you think about rebuilding the country. That's the one thing. The second thing I would say, and, and, and this I really... Uh, implore you is I am a big believer that your solutions have to come from within. That means that you know you need to look at your own constraints and resources. What I mean by that is that you know Ukraine has unique capabilities, unique context, geopolitically, geographically, ecologically, etc. So you have to identify what makes Ukraine Ukraine so unique in the world. And whatever frugal innovation strategy you create, has to be customized, personalized, right? By Ukrainian people, with Ukrainian people, 
for Ukrainian people. That means that even what I said today, you have to take it, as you rightly said, Slava, like a philosophy. Oh, Navi gave us an idea, but now we are going to take it and look at how we can apply it, you know, in the Ukrainian context, right? This is what's not happened. What happens is that as soon as you come out of crisis, we look for best practices elsewhere, right? And, and, and we just adopt them, you know, rapidly and, and we scale them up without paying attention to whether they can be relevant, right, for the local context. So it means that first celebrate the frugal innovations already happening right now during the war and think about how you can scale them up. Uh, maybe, you know, you can even create a catalog, you can create a database, it could be a website where you showcase them uh, as a way to create a sense of pride among Ukrainian people. And then the second thing is, you know, hopefully when the war is over, you need to have a, 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 a national kind of a discussion on, uh, you know, Estonia has done that, right, Lithuania, which is essentially like a participative democracy, democracy, right, where you essentially invite citizens to co-create an innovation strategy for the whole country. Of course, frugal could be an aspect of it, but it has to take into account what's unique about Ukraine, right, in terms of, again, the constraints you're going to face in the future that are unique to Ukraine, and the unique resources you have in Ukraine that no other country has. So this is a two piece of accommodation I would offer you. Thank you very much. Be careful with uh, with terms participating. Uh, uh, another uh, famous French uh, recently used it like participating uh, socialism, and uh, and this could bring us to to another long and uh, difficult discussion. I I, I meant uh, Thomas Piketty. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, but by the way, just to clarify, what I mean by participatory democracy, all I mean is that it has to be bottom up. That's what I mean, right? In other words, yeah. it has to be decentralized, more bottom up so that people believe that they participate in the solution, right? But yeah. let, sorry, interrupting you, we, we have a time pressure uh, as well, but let's try all uh, to somehow to promote the new term without back, uh, you know, build better, and then I don't know, build better future, build better for the future, something like this, but this build back immediately. Uh, yeah. uh, Remove the back, that should take it out the back. That's right. defines yes. everything we'll do yeah. without without better. And then what is better, uh, that would be difficult. So please, uh, you're, you're traveling, you're delivering a lot of a lot of speeches uh, um, let's try to somehow no, to I, change, I, I change, change the idea of re regenerate ukraine is a good one right you talk about you already have that right i think the idea of regenerating ukraine right and and with the three dimensions right people okay. place okay. that uh, that that is a good strategy actually we'll try to promote this and uh, uh, we at the moment it, uh, uh, to to say uh, thank you very much it was very grateful uh, and you. your enthusiasm uh, actually charge uh, uh, us uh, charge us to think positively despite there were several, several let's say pessimistic comments about sustainability and this idea of sharing and sustainability uh, are, are really wide to discuss within uh, 10 15 minutes uh, but again um, Robbie, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for your time, uh, for your enthusiasm, for your promotion and good ideas uh, that we can leave, we can produce and invent uh, and uh, uh, not invent, innovate uh, uh, without patenting uh, something great for, for many, many people. Uh, and um, we are looking forward to meeting you uh, one day again in Ukraine, in the peaceful Ukraine, uh, after we shall be able to demonstrate not only uh, this uh, metal arm uh, um, um, defense for, for our uh, military, but, but also something really great uh, that's uh, that can be expanded uh, and Ukraine will be known uh, worldwide for all this. Uh, thank you uh, and uh, dear participants. And I want to thank the Ukrainian people for inspiring us. Uh, thank you and uh, you know I'm actually a big admirer of your resilience. So everything I talked about this Jugat mindset I see that you know in your country right now. So thank you so much and uh, and keep fighting. Thank you. And uh, what, what is left uh, for me is just to remind you that uh, Reinforce UA project is going on. Uh, and at the moment, it should be a routine. And I do hope that you already uh, made a reservation in your, uh, in your calendar for the next Wednesday at, uh, uh, at 6 p.m. Kiev time. And we shall meet another great uh, uh, lecturer and presenter, uh, Dr. John Morrison, um, uh, who is the head of the Institute for Human Rights and Business. 
uh, and we shall uh, speak how, uh, in, in other terms, business will influence and may affect, uh, impact uh, society uh, in, 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 in good way, which is also very important in Ukraine, because if in Ukraine exists a force at the moment more or less organized and efficient, not still frugal, but, but efficient, this is a business companies, and we need to uh, think uh, about responsibility of business, not only of econo economic responsibility, but social responsibility responsibilities as well. So I'm looking forward to meet you all next Wednesday at 6 p.m. And um, uh, currently at, at present, uh, uh, goodbye, have a nice day. And um, let's see, uh, I see you. Thank you once again, uh, uh, Novi. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for having great me. Speech. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for, before and after the victory. Every week on ReinforceUA.com